Thank you as well from my side. Just again, a short check is the because it says that my bandwidth is too low. Uh, can you hear my voice clearly? Yes, I can hear your voice. However, you are breaking up when it comes to the video. So maybe we would have to kill your video just in to make sure you're fine. That was funny. The moment I asked the question, it kicked me out of the internet. <laughs> So if you can hear me again, welcome everyone. It's uh, a pleasure to see you all joining for this um, interesting topic, I would say, because we're living in interesting times that are uh, emotionally and also um, from a business perspective, challenging to all of us. Um, I myself had the pleasure to um, co-found um, Impact Hub Munich uh, seven years ago and stepped out of that role as a founder and managing director uh, two years ago and have embarked on a long journey of um, inner development, I would say. Um, and during that time, I have also um, worked more deeply with Axel, uh, whom I'm super glad to have here on board for this session with us. And in the next uh, 15 minutes, we're going to learn about um, emotional self-regulation and leadership and how that is connected. Um, because as we're all in the social innovation startup slash you know, business world, we're all impacted by the situation. And as we have to take care, not only of um, our business, but also of our teams, and then most importantly, also of ourselves, we can easily feel overwhelmed in these times emotionally, but also from the input that we receive all the time. So with Flora, we thought it would be of great help to everyone to have a session with somebody who is really well versed in the world of emotions and how to be or deal with them. And so I'm glad to welcome you, Axel, to our session here. Um, you are as Flora already mentioned, an expert in many fields. You have uh, seen the business world inside out. You have served in management positions, but you have also worked with uh, family offices. You have worked with social entrepreneurs on many ranges along the spectrum you know, of building your business, but also how to stay sane and grounded in that. So Axel, with that, um, I would love to invite you to share a little bit about with us about your own journey and how you came to work with emotions in the organizational context. Well, thank you for the invitation first. When did I start my journey? I think when I was working in the um, Daimler organization, automotive field, uh, I was responsible for a kind of change management and uh, organizational development. And what we learned was that about 70% uh, of our um, processes uh, failed in a way, partly or completely. And we always ask ourselves, um, what are we doing wrong? Is it the method? Uh, but uh, the more uh, experiences we gathered, it's, it has something to do with the people who are supposed to, to live the change. And that's then my interest started in uh, exploring the psyche of, of man. And finally, I ended uh, with trauma. trauma and, and there I concentrated on the three levels of trauma, which is collective trauma, intergenerational trauma, and uh, biographical trauma. And uh, well, and, and today I start to connect it more and more with the world of business it's still quite a kind of taboo but it's it's loosening up <laughs> people know that they are more than their organization that there is a not only an outer world but an inner world as well and you should take care of your inner world as much as you care about your outer world that is something we we right now learn with uh, covid 19 <laughs> as well so from the experience that you gather, how can we understand ourselves in this situation better? 
what is happening to us individually? What emotions are most likely to arise in this kind of situation? And what is also happening on a, on a more collective level that we might need to understand in order to then look at our own business and how do we deal with the challenges right now? On a superficial level, we all experience an interruption of our normal life. Almost nobody can continue as he did before. So um, we are, um, in a way, we, ha we are just leaving our normal habits and try to reorganize us in, in many various ways. That is on a superficial level. On a deeper level, we are confronted with a kind of helplessness. There we have a, a virus and we, we still don't know how to deal. There's no um, vaccine yet. So we are, we are exposed to a kind of danger um, and we cannot estimate exactly how to deal with it, how dangerous is it. Um, for example, do I belong to the group which is uh, endangered a lot or not? And uh, I think, on, and on a third level, it's uh, the way of, of traveling, the way how we deal with nature and so on. Is it the way we can really continue without having a pandemic, pandemic uh, every three or four years? And this is, I think, the, the chance we have right now to, to think over our normal patterns of personal behavior, of doing business, of communicating with each other, and so on and so on. In our preparation, Axel, we also talked about how it is difficult in these days for entrepreneurs, but also for leaders, um, in any kind of organizational context yeah. to find the right answers or to lead in ourselves and others in the right way. What are some experiences that you are hearing of, that you are seeing, and how could you, what could you tell to entrepreneurs and leadership and leaders to start with? In a way, we are moving in uncharted territories. What we all do is uh, we resume to measures and patterns which were successful in the past. And we are just trying if they still work. And in some experience, in some fields, we, we notice they do not work anymore like they did before. And this causes a kind of uncertainty, uh, insecurity, um, well, navigating in uncharted uh, waters always confronts you with your feelings. Because uh, the problem for, or the, the challenge for, for leaders of organizations or of, uh, of certain uh, divisions is they have to deal with their own feelings and they have to de de deal with the feelings of their co-workers and, and other people. So in times of crisis, you have a, an arousal of a lot of feelings and emotions. If you are in, uh, in calm times, uh, you can in a way do business as, as usual, processes are functioning. And in times of crisis and arousal, it does not function in the way it did before. And you have to integrate uh, the level of emotions into the kind you, you lead yourself and other people. I would love to understand a little bit more um, how self-regulation and emotional regulation can even work in an organizational context because I, I can imagine it's you know for me as a person but it might also be interesting for you to talk a little bit about that what does self-regulation mean 
for us as a person, but how does it even work in an organizational context where feelings or emotions often don't have such a big place? It's quite similar. Um, in my opinion, you need at least uh, four, a framework of four components. The first component is you, um, to self-regulate your emotions is safeness. You must feel yourself safe and you must have an idea that the, the organization is safe as well. For example, that it doesn't uh, run out of money within the next three days or so. So safeness is one important factor. The other one is uh, what you need is trust. Trust in yourself and the others that, uh, that you can on one hand rely on each other in a time of crisis and have the trust that you will find a good way out. If you miss that, um, people usually don't follow you. The third thing is what you need is orientation. Um, what is happening? Um, do I understand why it's happening? Uh, do I have a clear idea what we are doing and, what, and where we are heading for? Orientation is uh, in times of uncertainty um, or crisis is essential for, for people and organizations. And the fourth thing I would like to mention is self-agency. It's the feeling that you are not exposed to a situation where you can do anything, but where you can do something which makes sense and is contributing to solving the crisis or problems uh, you are facing. So I would name those four uh, factors and it's, and you, you can transfer it to your personal life as well as to organizational life. I was just pausing here for a second because a big truck was passing by. Yeah. I wanted to keep your ears safe. Yeah. <laughs> so actually you, you mentioned these four dimensions that are important for emotional self-regulation. Yeah, it was uh, safeness, it was trust amongst people, um, it was the orientation, and it was self-agency, which can be understood as a way to feel or see that I have an impact in the world. Yeah. All of these factors, due to the fact that all of us are confined in a way to a space and to a life that we're not used to, mm -hmm. um, what we're at least what I'm hearing also from our own network, from members and makers alike, is that there is a sense of overwhelming, overwhelmment happening um, emotionally, but also um, rationally, because the situation simply has never been before. Mm -hmm. um, so. I would love you to talk a little bit about the um, more biological and ne neuroscience background mm -hmm. of what is happening right now and why this situation is also from that perspective difficult to deal with um, before we then you know, can move also looking into and what can actually help us to deal with these, this kind of situation. Well, I will make a, a short trip into trauma. <laughs> um, you just mentioned the word, if you make an overwhelming experience. An overwhelming experience is a, that is the typical kind of trauma. For uh, trauma is an overwhelming experience for the mind and the body of, of a person. It's, a, it's an experience or an incident which cannot be regulated by the nervous system and cannot be integrated into the, the storyline of a person's life. And this then leads to, to isolation and separateness and more to over you can develop a lot of uh, psychological or uh, physical symptoms. So 
the the kind of uh, of experience we are now making is in a way overwhelming and it has a, if you follow the media you see uh, you um, the whole day is filled with uh, corona news and there's the danger to be drawn into this news and what you need uh, necessarily to be not overwhelmed is to um, not to dissociate but to step back from the railway to see the whole train so you need you have to put some distance um, between the the whole corona stuff and you if you don't have the distance you can't feel uh, your own body uh, you can't feel your feelings you are just um, dealing with the incident with everything that happens and you lose the contact to yourself which is uh, vital not to lose that context in order to not feeling overwhelmed you only feel overwhelmed if you are drawn into something which is bigger than you and uh which in a way uh sucks you up or uh, where you get lost And how can that be understood on a on the level of the brain? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because yeah. I understand the concept of how this is happening, but what is actually going on inside of the body? Well, normally we um, we have our rush. I spare you all the the medical details. Normally we <laughs> we uh, we think and manage our life with our rational brain. Um, if we get in a situation of feeling overwhelmed, it's a feeling. And then our, uh, our emotional brain is activated. And normally our emotional brain and our rational brain have no direct connection. And what always happens if the emotional brain is activated, it takes, uh, it gets in the driver's seat. Once you are emotionally triggered, forget about rational thinking. <laughs> so, and there, but there's one way out. There is a, here on this side, there's a small thing which is responsible for self-awareness. And if this is working, then this is linking the rational brain with the emotional brain. But in, but in order to, uh, to have that region activated, um, you have to, to have a look at yourself. You must feel your own body. You must reflect. You must meditate. You must be in calmness. This region does, is out of order if you are in a hurry, if you are... Uh, in in rough waters or whatever you must you must be in that area where you are sitting <laughs> looking at the blue sky and he listening to the birds <laughs> <laughs> yeah i brought them here for us it's uh <laughs> or at least i'm deciding to let them be with us for this session i felt it was a good background noise um axel thank you so much for these um for these backgrounds um, and uh, I just, uh, because I see people dropping in the session and also sharing on the chat, just as a, as a short reminder, say to everyone that if you have questions or if you have thoughts, if you feel to share also an experience of your own, please do so in the chat because uh, Flora and I are also track, uh, keeping track of the questions that you're asking. So we can also put them into the conversation with Axel that you're having. Yeah. So, um, what Axel and I also had in mind that uh, for this session, it would be great to um, lead us through some exercises and tools that can be helpful to us in these kind of situations. Mm -hmm. So I talk, talked with Axel before and, he, and we said that all of this is of course an invitation. So, you know, whatever, 
of kind of small exercise we do, you can choose to join or not. Um, but we also felt that beside understanding, be, beside understanding the background of you know, emotional self-regulation and how that affects us in our work. We also felt it was important to give us, a, you know, a set of simple tools that we might be able to use every day for ourselves, but also maybe in the context of our organizations. So that just as a parenthese for us now. Um, and maybe Axel, just as a last uh, question before we move into, you know, one of the first exercises, why is all of this relevant to us in organizations? Why is this especially relevant for leaders or entrepreneurs? Well, if we would have been back 20 or 30 years, it wouldn't be any problem at all. But since we are facing a, a time and uh, I think a century of, of profound uh, transformation, concerning climate change and so on and so on. Uh, we in a way have to reinvent ourselves, our organizations, uh, the products we are doing, that it's carbon neutral and so on, which means uh, we have to, to go through a phase of not only modification, but really transformation within a time of about 30 years to become carbon neutral, which uh, face, faces us with challenges we have had never before. We never, had, we never before had the necessity to change profoundly in such a short time. And for that, we have no experience and there's no example in history. And this is something we have to realize first. And our brain is not made for this. It's not made for this kind of speed. We can understand things quickly, but uh, we can't do them that quickly. We have to, to integrate emotions into, uh, into this, this process and this way of acting. And uh, if you want to, do, to change faster than before, then you have to integrate the, the body, the mind, and the feelings. And uh, in organizations, you integrated, I think, the mind, yes, sometimes feelings, the body, never. But most of the feelings are stored in the body. So um, I would strongly recommend uh, to take in all three uh, aspects. So actually, I think now at the latest, we're at that point where at least I feel myself in the place where I'm asking, how do we do that? Okay. How do I do that for myself? And how do we do that in an organizational context where we're used to, well, now we're digital. So that's, a, you know, that's an extra challenge that we have. Yeah, we're not meeting anymore. But how can that be done? Okay. I, uh, if you want to give you a small kind of exercise, um, just notice uh, where you sit and just notice how you sit. Only feel your spine, your back, maybe the feet on the ground. And watch the way how you breathe. Is it more deeply into the upper lungs, the lower lungs, into the belly? And only watch. And try if you fe can feel your body the beat of your heart just feel if you are more calm or excited and you can make a small experiment 
if you feel connected, when you feel connected with your body, just try to see the room where you are sitting with fresh eyes. And just watch if you can manage or if it looks as it looks always. And while you're doing this, just watch your breath. The way the air flows into the lungs and out of the lungs. And just stay maybe 30 seconds in silence to end the small exercise. Okay. <laughs> if somebody wants to deepen this, I have more than, I think, 15 years experience of Zen meditation. <laughs> we can make a course together or something like that. <laughs> Do you mind giving us a little background on what is happening with this kind of exercise? Mm -hmm. Because it seems to be so simple to go inwards, outwards, inwards, outwards. W what is happening? Well, what happens is, uh, if I explain it for the kids, it's um, normally our normal state is we are, we are out of our body and we are um, living in our brain, in our thoughts. And uh, children learn this when they start uh, going to school. Then they learn to think, to calculate, and so on. And from that time on, we mostly we are trained to think. And while you are thinking, you cannot feel your body. You are thinking. And uh, for children, it's quite normal to be in their body when you see them playing. Uh, they are self-forgotten uh, time plays no role. They are deeply connected with their body and that what they are doing. And this is something we, um, we must acquire again. We, we must we learn it. Um, for example, most people of us like it to be out in the nature. And uh, that is a good occasion just to feel how you are walking, just to smell the wood, the hear the birds, to be connected with all your senses, to feel the wind on the skin, whether it's cold or warm. And the more uh, we are connected with our body, um, the more we get connected with our feelings as well. And this is one reason why sometimes we don't want to be connected with our body because we don't like all the feelings we have stored in the body. We only like joy, happiness, and so on. But the body is no, uh, um, it's no store where you can choose. Either you get it all or nothing. And that is why it's not so popular to uh, 
to be in in connection with the body in our culture in our western culture in africa it's quite different south america and so on they are more connected to the, their bodies and it's um great you you mentioned nature at the same time people are also mostly confined at their homes and don't often have the the possibility to go out there right now so i also just want to you know keep that in mind while we while we speak about this and at the same time i would love you to also um speak a little bit about how can we take this now to the, to the organizational context how can we especially in times where you know we cannot meet in person yeah we do most things digital or on the phone how can we create spaces where you know these emotions can have a place you know that is quite a challenge because um we have a two-dimensional medium sitting here in front of uh the body is a three-dimensional uh medium and in a way we have to to replace the body the loss of the body on this uh on this media here you can you can do it to a certain degree the certain degree is um gather with people where you can change your feelings with um people whom you trust um whom you can tell what it's really looking inside um people were not afraid of that they might use it or not understand you where you yeah we really trust and if you have such a community that that's a great asset you have in these times but you are restricted it's uh the social distance distancing um i think we still uh do not really recognize all the consequences of it we in a way um lose our bodily our bodily dimension we cannot hug anymore and this is part of our human being and maybe we uh while we miss it maybe we we recognize what kind of worth it is it's a part of our human existence and i think we we a little bit underestimated that dimension so that we might find it again when things go back to normal if there will be a normal in this in this development um, i would like to take again uh, just a short second to um, remember people that uh, if you have questions you can put them in the chat and at the same time um, Axel was willing to, um, you know, also to hear individuals, you know, people's experiences and, you know, see how we can work with that. So if you wish to share an experience or to share a more specific question that you have, uh, you can just uh, tell it to us in the chat and we'll get back to you and call you into the digital space and stage if you want to. Yeah. So Actually, and also in our preparation before, we also talked about um, what leaders can do in their own organizations. Uh, and you shared that it is tough, of course, to do this in the digital space. And we might not be able to do it as well if we had the possibility to physically meet. But still, what are some ideas that people can still do also meeting in spaces like Zoom or Skype or just using the technologies that are there? Um, when you are in the position of a leader, you must, on the one, on one hand, you must regulate yourself. And on the other hand, uh, you should be, uh, uh, full of 
empathy for the feelings of your colleagues, co-workers, employees, whoever. And this you, you must balance in a way, your own emotions and the emotions of the others. Because in times of crisis, there come up a lot of emotions which want to be seen and acknowledged. You don't have to do much about the emotions. Just acknowledge them and let people talk about them. Um, on the second level is um, if you are in a, in a leading position, uh, people view you and have an eye on you uh, on a much uh, stronger and more intense, intensive way than in normal times. And you are a kind of role model for the others, how you handle yourself, the others, and the crisis itself. And what people, when they, when they watch you, they must see that, uh, that you have a clear idea um, how you are navigating through this kind of crisis. And that this gives them security, then they trust in you, and so on. That circle I, I, I talked about to you. And um, so leading in, in, in a time of crisis is, uh, is quite more challenging for, for leaders because you must handle yourself, you must get a clear orientation, and you must be aware that it, that is the face where you are a kind of role model for the others as you are not in normal times. So um, quite challenging. And you, in those times, it could be helpful if you really have somebody whom you trust in. And because when you're in a leading position, uh, you are not, you don't can tell the other, well, I feel the same way you do. Uh, I have no idea at all, like you. <laughs> this would be not very clever. <laughs> but of course, leaders have those feelings, even they do not admit, admit it, but they have them. So that they should have somebody whom they really trust in and uh, who keeps his mouth shut, <laughs> whom they can talk to. And this is, I would strongly recommend that uh, you get somebody or have somebody um, where you can be yourself and uh, decide the, the role you have to, to fit in and uh, you have to lead the others. I think one uh, one aspect that um, we also talked about in our preparation was, and you mentioned it already, was that um, emotions need to be felt, they need to be seen, but they don't necessarily need to be worked with so much, you know. And and you just said that, you know, as a leader, we can just acknowledge the feelings of others, let them express it. Yeah, but then what? <laughs> Well, I think everybody knows uh, the, the classical story. The, the woman comes home and tells her man what has happened, everything. And, uh, and she is very emotional. And men usually think, uh, what can I do? And the woman just wants you to listen. You don't have to do anything. She just wants to be there with all her feelings, with everything. And that is something uh, we should know about feelings. Feelings want to be felt, and they want to be felt by the owner of the feelings. Um, we often feel the feelings of our neighbor, of somebody else, but not our own. And that is important. If you can feel your own feelings and share them, then they can, they don't have to make such a, such an uproar anymore. They can calm down. 
And this is something um, which, especially for managing persons who are paid for doing something, um, it's quite difficult to learn that here it's about letting something happen. When you work with feelings, it's not about doing, but let it happen, let it be there, and then it starts to change. Thank you, Axel. Um, there was a question in the chat by uh, Luminaria um, who would like to um, know a bit more about the lack of interrelational emotional regulation in isolation that is happening right now. Yeah, Because usually we can regulate our emotions in a different way when we are able to go out, when we are able to meet people, when we are able to put stress somewhere else and bringing it back home. So, you know, what kind of um, cues can help us with this? You know, um... Yeah, um, this kind of isolation is putting us under stress, which, which causes pressure, pressure or just the other way around, pressure causes stress. So what can you do if you're really uh, confined to your own rooms? and cannot go out, uh, do some kind of, of exercise, of yoga, um, if you have some uh, training devices, use them. It's, uh, the body needs the movement. Um, if, you, if the body comes to a standstill, what happens in the body is that, um, all the energy stored in the body um, accumulates. And then it's, it can be that it goes into emotions and then we come into a state of uh, arousal and explosion. So uh, the body work, workout is essential in, in my view. We are moving animals. And we are not used to um, to being kept in a in a cage. If you have the chance to go into nature, use it as much as you can. Every day, at least ninety minutes. I feel it's always helpful to have <laughs> clear prescribed medicine. <laughs> yeah. nature is, is nature is a medicine in a way you know yeah. so, as, as you <laughs> said yeah um actually looking a little bit at the time we have about 12 minutes left and uh, flora shared with me that she has some uh she has some questions um left also for, for to ask you in the end as part of the q a um is it maybe, I think it might be a good idea to transition us into that, uh, maybe coming back to the first exercise that we did, so that we could. Um, yeah, may, just I think, I would suggest uh, before we start into to going into questions and answers, just have 30 seconds of silence and just watch your breath. Calm down a little bit. Watch your thoughts and let them flow away. <laughs>
Okay, here we go. <laughs> so, Flora, may I hand it over to you? Absolutely. Thanks a lot, and thanks for that breathing exercise. Um, we had a very quick question from uh, Helen, if it's 19 or 90, but uh, if I understood correctly, it's 90 minutes to go into nature every day, right? Nine zero. Yeah, if possible, 60 minutes would be already good, but 90 minutes is great. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, we have both some questions uh, handed in beforehand, so thanks to everyone who already did that. And also we collected the ones that you had put in the chat. Um, there is, uh, let's start with the, with the, I mean, there are some that are connected more to what you said earlier about um, company dynamics and how things are playing out in the organization. So to kind of like, um, take a few moments to talk about that um, organizational sphere. Um, Arslan uh, from Pakistan had asked how company dynamics will change in the post-COVID world. So if you think that the values of a company can or will transform. When you pass through a crisis, there are two main reactions. Um, the one big reaction is a backlash into the old patterns. And the other uh, general uh, reaction is that you see the crisis as an opening window to do something new. And in, the, in this phase of crisis, that is really possible because old patterns do not work anymore like they did before. People are more open, people are more afraid, uh, people are more courageous uh, to try something new. So it's a, it's a real big change to change cultures and organizations, to, um, to change uh, styles of leadership, of communication. The only thing is, or the, the prerequisite for this is you must be willing to change yourself. If you are not changing yourself in the times of a crisis, then you can uh, change in the organization, whatever you want. It probably will fall back into its old state. So it's a two, twofold uh, kind of development, the development of yourself, learning from this kind of crisis and going into something new and the organization as well and it has to go both parallel thank you for that i think very nicely connected to that is uh one, a reflection from David Parejo, who said that we're kind of grieving the loss of uh, our way of life um and that he's asking if we shouldn't move forward and take this opportunity to build a much more better way of living. So that's a little bit kind of like the next step of what you were just hinting towards. I'm on your side. <laughs> yes. Um, I think well, what I see is uh, a lot of people and especially younger people, younger means uh, until 35, 40, they were really seeing the, the chance for a profound change, especially in the respect of climate change, uh, change and so on, that we can really change something and move something forward. Um, and I think we should use this chance. Uh, we will experience the backlash anyway that will come because uh, a lot of business models uh, are in danger now and people companies want to earn possibly as much money as before in some uh, fields it will not work anymore and yes take the chance and go forward <laughs> so i can only encourage you <laughs> Love it. That was also one of the questions sent in beforehand. If there was a hopeful vision for the future, I think we just got that. 
<laughs> and uh, to this point of that discrepancy of where we have to shed certain things or where things can go into opposite extremes, William Rawlinson Plant made a comment about that. And thanks for being so active in the chat, William. Um, he thinks that you know we're reevaluating past values we're putting behind us dead skin and focusing on community stakeholders and returning what has been taken but he also thinks that the opposite will happen so he says it's going to be more extreme do you have any thoughts related to that was his question it's not going more extreme uh, automatically but there are groups of people, and in my view, it's especially young people who, who really experience and feel they cannot continue like they did before. And they are willing to change and they are already on their way. And on the other hand, we have the people um, who don't want to give up their living standards, their standards of wealth and whatever. And and I think this crisis um, gives more power to both directions. The one who is going to change and the one who is going to stick to the old. We will have, I think, we will have more struggle and fight about that. And in my, from my view as a, as a trauma expert, we need uh, new designs of communicating and understanding each other. Otherwise, uh, the chance to, to fight each other will grow rapidly. Thank you. Um, we have a few more questions that are either focused on kind of leading people or being a leader yourself, um, as well as also on uh, the role of communication in that. Um, I just want to be mindful of time because we had set this um, uh, live session to go for an hour, which is happening uh, and going to be there in about three minutes. So um, for everybody who can and would like to stay on a little bit longer, um, both Axel and Yosha had said that um, they can stay on a little bit longer if they wanted to, in case we have a vivid conversation, which is happening right now. So thanks um, in advance for agreeing to that. Um, I will just... Uh, take a second um, now to say for everybody who has to leave um, that there is the opportunity to tune into um, a next edition of live uh, on the 30th of April, which is going to be in the afternoon again to kind of care for the different time zones uh, and then on May 14. So um, stay tuned to the channels. We're confirming the uh, the speakers and topics as we have uh, quite a lineup there. So thanks for everybody who was here uh, in case you have to go and have a wonderful day and remember to breathe, I think is a good one. Um, and for everybody who would like to stay and uh, still feels like their question needs to be answered or even if something else came up now, we have the great opportunity to have these two um, experts here with us. So if I look at the questions that were also sent in, coming back to that, I would say um, the, so there were a few on leadership. So you talked a little bit about those corporate dynamics and the extremes. Now, in terms of leadership, we had a question that came in beforehand that said um, how to bridge the differences between leading people online and on premises leadership. You had talked about that a little bit um, earlier as well, but um, is there something you would like to add to that? I think if you know the people very well, it should be uh, not a big deal um, to lead them online uh, for a limited uh, time. I think the problem is more if you don't know the people or don't know them that well, if you don't know how to react them, then you have to, to ask a lot more questions how do you feel? What are you doing? What is occupying you? What do you expect from me? What, what do you need from me? What, should, what can you do? What should I do? So that is asking, asking, and asking. 
to, to really understand who is sitting there on the other line uh, where you can see a, a more or less friendly face, <clears throat> but you don't see what the person is thinking and feeling. So the only chance you have is asking, 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 and expressing yourself, what you think. Um, when, you get, when you have the body, um, we have body language. And uh, we, can, we can see uh, sometimes, yeah, he means that or that, or he moves this or that way. We don't have that on the screen. So you have to, to explain yourself a lot more, what you think, what you really want, what you expect them to do, and so on and so on. You have to do a lot more asking and talking than in normal times. A very good and important point, and that segues into um, the next question that was around communication and, and how you think that communication can help in this new world. So this in this moment, but also in the future. It depends on the quality of communication. <laughs> Are we exchanging simply words? Or can we establish a kind of communication where we feel uh, more deeply interconnected? And I think that is uh, an exercise for uh, advanced people. <laughs> you must practice that. And it's, I'm, I'm still uh, quite une unexperienced in, um, is the, is for example, is team development uh, in a chat room possible? Or don't, don't you have to meet each other face, face to face? I think uh, we're experimenting with that. We are learning. I don't have a, have a final answer for that. I mean, I'm learning myself. Even with 61, mamma mia. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> um, oh yeah, we have um, another question that's actually coming in right now. I think that fits quite nicely um, from William. Um, and he's asking you if you can tell a little bit about the relation between social media and this transformation communication that needs to happen. Oh. <laughs> That is a big field for a trauma expert. Um, That's exactly your field, huh? So, yeah. Social media. Well, I can, what I can answer is uh, what kind of effect the social media might have um, on your uh, emotional self regulation. Um, if you get confronted with with news and uh, and people and uh, pictures which support you, which uh, let you calm down, which make you secure, with which give you orientation, um, then it's quite good. If it irritates you, if it uh, causes a lot of arousal, if you um, start to fight if you uh, if you start doubting um, if it causes in you a lot of feelings which you cannot handle for yourself then uh, I think I would reduce my uh, social media um, consume <laughs> Uh, Flora, do you mind if I ask, ask a question on that? Of course. Uh, so, I mean, in a way, it's, um, you know, your tip also to reduce social media um, if it is experienced as being unhelpful. Um, it's also showing a little bit the different ways that our gener the, the older and the younger generations are experiencing this situation. You know, because for... Uh, you know, our old neighbor that uh, lives around the block, uh, social media just basically doesn't exist. Yeah. 
And you mentioned earlier in your conversation that um, we will, might have a gap between the people who would love to drive change and the people who would like to go back to the old or, you know, get to as much money as possible. So we, we might see also uh, a, disp a disparation between the generations. What could, what could be a vision for that? What could be an idea that you have? Um, because we will have that conversation between the older and the younger generations, if we want it or not. And so what can be helpful in that? Because the, the positions can be quite extreme. Um, I really think we need uh, a kind of new designs of, um, of dialogue between the, the older and the younger, between the change makers and the preservers, um, between the, the groups that the, right now we face the phenomenon, people are not talking to each other, people are not really exchanging their views, but everybody gets stuck into his own world and think it's the only world which exists. And this regularly leads to confrontation and in the end to war. We, uh, we have to find uh, new designs of, of understanding each other on a rational, but on an emotional level as well. Because uh, the older ones, they are triggered by fear. They are triggered by the fear of loss they are triggered by the loss of, uh, of power and so on. And if you don't acknowledge and address that fear underlying the argumentation, you will never meet each other and, uh, and find uh, a common way out of the situation into a new solution. So um, I'm thinking myself, uh, what kind of uh, of, of dialogue designs uh, between the old and, la and uh, young and can we, can we establish even online? I think that's a very interesting point and definitely something that needs more thinking and dialogue in order <laughs> to design something meaningful. Um, and with that, I would love to segue into our closing. Um, thank you so much for staying on a little bit longer, everybody who's still here. Um, and first of all, and foremost, thank you so much, Axel and uh, Joscha, for joining us today and for talking a little bit about, yeah, the, the entrepreneurship uh, in, in difficult times, but also leadership as well as personal mindfulness that is really, really important in order to stay sane but also lead from a very integrative place and um i think more people would love to even talk longer about this so we'll see if there's maybe something we could do in the future but for now a big big thank you to you uh, also a big thank you to all of the participants who were here today thank you all for um streaming in um, from all the places around the world and um, we will uh, send you a satisfaction survey to kind of see and for, did you like it? What did, didn't you like? And to uh, make sure that we can keep improving for you. Um, and with that, you will also get the recording from this call. So you can tune into the most juicy bits once again. And um, for the next lives, I'm just going to quickly share my screen because that's always easier for people. Um, so the third edition, as I had mentioned before, is going to be on April 30th at 5 p.m. Central European time. And the fourth edition we will have on the 14th of May. And as I said as well, we are still confirming the topics. Um, and last but not least, um, if you want to connect with us uh, or have any questions or comments, um, you can do so at the email address that is there. So it's connect at impacthub.net. Feel free to find us and we are, there we go. <laughs> we were glad to have you. Thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of the day and remember to breathe. Thank you, Flora. Thank you, Yasha. It was a real pleasure and thank you for being such wonderful hosts. <laughs> thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye thank everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>